Okay, so uh, today we'll talk about three architects, uh, Henri Labrust, um, um, then Jules Hardouin Mansart, and uh, uh, Hans um, Halling. Uh, Henri Labrust, Frenchman. Let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. If, that is if uh, the, the system is allowing me to advance. Uh, I see it's giving me a hard time. Okay, here he was. So uh, born in 1801 and died in 1875 at 74, um, a gentleman, no doubt. So Henri Labrust, you see born on May 11th uh, in Paris, um, was a French architect important for his early use of iron frame construction. And please remember this, iron frame construction. Uh, Labrust entered the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1819, won the Prix d'Europe for architecture in 1824, and spent the period from 1825 to 1830 in Italy, after which he opened a studio in Paris. The good life, five years in Italy. Labrust is primarily remembered for the two Parisian libraries he designed, formidable libraries. The Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve, built between 1843 and 1850, is still admired for the attractiveness and restraint of its decoration and for the sensitive use of exposed iron structural elements, columns and arches. La Bruce is also remembered for his second library project, the Reading Room, uh, from 1860-1867 of the Bibliothèque Nationale. Its roof consists of nine decorated metal domes supported by slender cast iron columns. And uh, we'll take a look at, 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 at his buildings. But first, here is a, a bust, uh, you know, uh, if you are famous, if you become uh, famous, uh, if you become a statue uh, after your death. And uh, this is um, what we are looking for all of us, but only a few of us will have this, uh, this honor. So Henri Labrust, Labrust, Henri Labrust structure brought to light. Indeed, he was excellent with cast iron uh, structure. Drawing, some drawings on Henri Labrust. Um, some of them uh, more abstract than others. As you can see, he studied carefully historical st styles. Well, he studied at Bazaar. So, you know, at Bazaar, uh, the ornament was still very much present. It was the 19th century. What can we do? Uh, he was born just a few years before Le Corbusier was born. But look at these fragments of the, of the, the cast iron um, uh, structure, you know, they ornament meets structure. So it's not just the structure, but it's also the ornamental intervention of the architect within the structure. And you are going to see the the beauty, actually, of, of, uh, of this, this procedure, of this kind of work, I think is very important. You see that it's not just structure and structure and structure. And I know very well that this is an obsession in our schools. The word ornament is not even pronounced. It's only the word structure. Structure, structure, analysis, structure, analysis, structure. No word about the ornament and no word about synthesis. Well, what is this? It's, it's an ornament, of course. These are ornaments made in cast iron. But you see, he brought beauty, he brought sensitivity to the structure. He didn't leave the structure all by itself. It became artistically endowed, and this is important. And you are going to see, this is actually a drawing of Viollet le Duc. Um, Anyway, uh, we are dealing with a very cultured um, architect, uh, you know, who received a rigorous uh, education in the system of Beaux-Arts and uh, who studied history very seriously, but he made some very innovative works. Those two libraries that I mentioned are excellent.
again and again. I do not tire stressing that you cannot have structure without ornament. In as much as you cannot have ornament without structure. Although Gottfried Semper inferred that actually the ornament came before the structure. Uh, I know it's, it sounds um, a, maybe even crazy, but it's not so. And I can explain maybe uh, with, with another occasion. Uh, the, the masculinist functionalist un, uh, understanding of uh, the beginnings of architecture is one opinion, one position, but it's not the only one. It's very interesting to compare Abelogie with Godfrey Semper. Abe, for Abelogie, <clears throat> The first house ever built was made with um, trunks of, uh, of trees and, you know, with beans and, uh, you know, the charpent, the, the roofing, and that's it, the house. But uh, <clears throat> Godfrey Zemper, who was a German, had a point. How could you make your first house with cut down trunks of trees when people at that time, those ancestors, didn't have the tools to cut down trees. Yeah, you cannot cut down tree when you don't even have a knife. So I think he was right when he thought that the first building ever built happened like this. Some hunters and uh, the fishermen, well, anyway, people, they went to hunt for animals with whatever, in whatever way they were able to. They return in the evening and they gathered around the fire. They had the fire, but they had no home. They had no house. We are talking here about the mythical beginnings of architecture. And Godfrey Semper said that they understood the value of fire, that fire was vital for them. And they understood they have to protect it, but how? So, you know, they looked around, they saw bushes, uh, you know, plants, so they, 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 they took, you know, uh, some of these, um, you know, plant material from bushes or other plants, and they began to weave it because they didn't have yet the tools to cut down trees, you know, and make the masculine structure of the building. So they created a, a panel of vegetal material that uh, became kind of like the first wall they surrounded fire with it. And the, the act of weaving has a certain implication for ornamentation. Because for example, an old, uh, or not so old, someone who weaves, um, you know, who embroiders a sweater. Let's say your grandmother embroiders a sweater. In the act of embroidering the sweater, uh, there is a certain contemplative disposition at work and the grandmother introduces some uh, ornamental things, simpler or more, more complex in the making of the sweater. It does very rarely, you know, the sweater is left uh, untouched by any kind of ornament. There is something about weaving and ornamentation. And that's why for Godfrey Semper, the first act of weaving is associated also with ornament. But ornament is excluded in, in, the, in, the, in the vision, from the vision of the functionalist, of the rigid function, functionalist of the beginning of the 20th century. But things, uh, you know, architecture didn't begin with functionalism and didn't end and will not end with functionalism. In fact, Patrick Schumacher identified about eight kinds of modernisms after functionalism, then two transitory tra or transitional periods uh, in, in the past 120 years, uh, deconstructivism and postmodernism, well, postmodernism and deconstruction and then five kinds of, he made this statement two years ago, five kinds of uh, uh, parameters. The last one being um, tectonism. Anyway, um, so, you know, architecture is very beautiful, but architecture cannot be reduced to that functionalism of the beginning of the 20th century. 
we are not at the beginning of the 20th century. We are, the, you know, the 20 years already advancing within the 21st century. Things changed. Saint Genevieve Library, uh, Place du Pantheon, Paris, 1838-1851, Henri Labrust. From the outside, it is as it is, you know, a 19th century Parisian building. But uh, you see people stay in line there because uh, Labrust is famous and his uh, library is famous. It's kind of nice to see people staying in line, you know, to enter a library when, you know, we were very accustomed to stay in line in Romania at uh, 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. in order to buy some milk that was in communism. Now, I don't know, now maybe we don't stay in line any longer. Uh, look, at the, look at the reading room of Saint Genevieve uh, library. It's not bad, is it? And look at the ceiling. Uh, and, and, and you see the ornamented cast iron structure. If it was not ornamented, it would have been more rigid and more simplistic. But because of the, you know, discrete ornamentation, it's lighter, it's more spirited, it's uh, more gentle, and it matters. Again, do not neglect ornament. Uh, I know the school doesn't encourage you to think in these terms, but, uh, you know, what else is here is ornament, clearly. Yes, there is structure, but there is also ornament. Look here at the, at the, at the bottom of, of the column. You know, there are, uh, there are elements of, of the structure which have a decorative uh, quality, which cannot be denied. And in its absence, the building would not have the grace that it has. And look here, you know, it's, it's a beautiful section through this building and it's, it's beautiful because because of the, the, the organic, uh, uh, the, the kind uh, intersection or meeting between structure and ornament. They collaborate. They work together for a, uh, for a, for a building, uh, for, for the inside, the interior of a building, which uh, uh, is not just, uh, you know, standing, but it's also graceful. And it has to be graceful. Well, fortunately, I know of a doctoral student who is doing his doctoral work exactly on ornamentation in Bucharest, yes. Um, Andrei Teatr is an, an assistant on the third year uh, in Bucharest, and his father is a professor at the uh, big years, in the big years. Anyway, um, Saint Genevieve, Henri Labrust. And uh, this is not the most spectacular one. The next one you are, we, we are going to see will uh, no doubt um, impress you. You see how, how beautiful this uh, cast iron work is? You know, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's metal, it's, it's iron. It's, uh, you know, essentially a cold material. But because of the gracefulness of the design, uh, the, the whole room is, uh, you know, uh, uh, spirited, and uh, there is a likeness that that this material uh, made possible. Instead of having a heavy structure, again, you know, you, you see here in this rendering the importance of ornament. In essence, ornament is <clears throat> is. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It, to me, ornament is what we see outside because it is spring. The trees in the spring, they become green and then uh, soon the flowers will show up. So the flowering of the trees represent in a way the ornaments of the trees. The trunk and the branches are the structure, but the leaves and the flowers are the ornament. Now, it's up to us. Do we want trees without any flowers and leaves? 
just, uh, you know, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Um, unless you want to say something. So here it is, Saint Genevieve, Paris, Paris. I think it's beautiful. And it's beautiful exactly because this man understood how to marry structure with ornament. Yes, you know, the rigid functional is to say, what is this nonsense? Why did he have to do this? <laughs> well, because this man was an architect, that's why. He wanted to, to make matter sing. He was interested in beauty, that's why. He expressed his feelings, you know, in, in this building and didn't let it be just, uh, you know, as a uh, structure told him to be. Patrick Schumacher said it uh, about two years ago, structure and ornament should come together. And it's true, they should come together. And because of parametric design, now whole buildings become kind of ornaments. Many you know, parametric buildings are in a way, you know, large scale, three-dimensional ornaments. Capricious in part, but capriciousness is part of Life is part of art, you know, it's, 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 it's about feeling, it's about emotion. Le Grand Seminaire de Rennes, devenu la Faculté de Lettres, puis des Sciences Economiques. Uh, it's an academic building uh, in Rennes, the, the Faculty of uh, of letters and then it became economic science. Um, well, this is the project. This is the building, less graceful towards the outside, but uh, let's see if inside is better. Uh, those two libraries are the best of his works, uh, but he, he did other buildings as well, maybe with less uh, resources, but even here, you know, we see interesting things, you know, the combination of stone, uh, work and uh, metal work or uh, cast iron. So there is a level of uh, innovation or, uh, you know, uh, unconventionality or uh, iconoclasm even here. You know, you could not have seen this sort of thing, you know, centuries ago, you know, but, but with La Brust, because, because uh, even the traditionalist has a need for change for innovation. And then if you bring together the innovation of your time with the, you know, learning and examples of the past, you get probably something like this. Now this one, you will see, it's more spectacular than the first library we saw, the reading room of the National Library in Paris from 1854 to 1875. Uh, this is a rendering of it, but you are going to see it because it still stands and is the same way. You see, it's called Salle La Bruste. Now it is called so. I don't think he did the whole building. He did just uh, that. Um, Sal La Bruce uh, carrying his name. Um, maybe he did also this Sal Oval, it's possible. Um, uh, here it is. Now, why would he so-called complicate himself to create the, that so-called complicated, uh, you know, uh, ceiling? Why? Well, in a way, it's a metaphor for knowledge. These people gather in the Bibliothèque Nationale in order to study. Now, imagine yourself being at the desk in this room and you look upwards. Normally, I think you get uplifted. Yes, uplifted. It gives you a, 
you know, a musical feeling in a way. It gives you the desire, you know, to, to study because, the, because beauty, perhaps Dostoevsky was right, beauty will save the world. If this was a flat roof, I don't think that would have had the same effect on those using the room. Look at this, you know, it's, it's graceful. It uh, has a degree of complexity. It's uplifting. I would say it is uplifting to study uh, these desks is uplifting with that thing above you that Labrust uh, invented and created and made possible. Look, even these people now, of course, this is, I don't know, a video or a film or whatever, but it goes with the room. The room is musical, the room is singing. And of course, these people are, uh, you know, uh, uh, dancing. It's this we have to understand. Are we creating buildings that sing or not? Of course, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. It's difficult. But if you are to deserve your name as an architect, you better try to make your building sing. Maybe even dance. Uh, and this building is. Is because of, because of the architect. Uh, Walter Grop, you said, um, you know, the, the, the work of the architect begins where the work of, an, of the engineer ends. I think he put it a little bit brutally, I mean, a little bit, uh, you know, sternly. But in essence, there is some truth there that, you know, the engineer makes the building stand. Although a good engineer wants more than that. The good engineer also has an artist within. But the architect for sure has to have that artist within. Otherwise, how, how would he call himself or herself an architect? This, this ceiling is the work of an architect. Uh, an architect who didn't ignore static, who didn't ignore structure, but who brought sensitivity in emotion in and music in. That's why, you know, those people are dancing here and not in a prosaic, uh, I don't know, I mean, look at this, look at this room, you know, it's, I imagine, I never visited it, but I imagine being there, you know, you breathe easier. You breathe easier because there is beauty. That's why you breathe easier. Henri Labrust, he knew something about uh, employing cast iron and he did beautiful things in the 19th century. So this is a building 100, more than one century and a half old. But beauty doesn't have age, really. It doesn't age. So this is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. And this is the Labruste room. An excellent work, isn't it? Now, I take issue with Peter Zumthor because he declared that a long time ago he stopped uh, thinking that architecture can save life or save whatever, you know, yeah, human life, life. But, okay, maybe architecture cannot so-called save life, but I think a good architecture 
has a positive effect on people, on people's lives. I don't know if it saves their lives, so to speak, but if you are uplifted by a building, it means the building contributes positively to life. And I find it a little bit cynical what he said, because if he truly believed that, why did he continue to build? I think you continue to build or you build exactly because you think, you feel that you can contribute to life in a positive way. And maybe even change, you know, to an extent, of course, we cannot expect that architecture will make Putin change his mind and end the war in Ukraine. Although he should think about the, 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 the many buildings that is destroying now, are being destroyed now. But of course, he's not thinking of that. He is not even thinking of the people who die. So yes, in, in, in that in that sense, architecture is limited. But in conditions of normality, I think architecture could uh, take a stand towards positiveness, towards uh, giving you optimism, towards giving you confidence that uh, life is worth living, and it is through beauty. And here there is beauty. Yes, there is technology. Uh, we have the, the LCD screens of the present. We have all kinds of things, but we also have statues. We have culture. We have ornament. We have the togetherness of, of that this generous room, uh, uh, you know, facilitates. So, you know, the human society uh, under normal conditions is uh, nourished by a good building and by a good architecture. This is, I think, the, the oval room. But the, again, the, the, the most splendid part of this room is, is at the top. Now, Hotel Touraine, East uh, Yurzen, now we can only see lesser buildings because after we saw his two masterpieces, um, we can only expect uh, less. Maybe this, is, this was the building he lived in. I don't know, Villa La Brust. It's possible, but we see here, although it's a building, you know, rather, you know, uh, not monotone, but a little bit stern, but still animated by touches of ornamentation, which uh, bring some sensitivity in. I wouldn't mind at all living in such a room. I confess, I would love it. You know, imagine, uh, you know, going to that balcony and you know, contemplating nature in the spring, and then return to the, you know, the books and the old furniture and the, uh, the bohemian disorder. I think it's beautiful. And look at the ceiling; it's very, very tall. Now, of course, we cannot afford, you know, uh, such tall uh, interiors uh, for uh, you know the majority of us. But La Brust, I guess, afforded it at his time. Hotel de Vilgris, 1865. Um, yeah, after after I we saw I saw that those two libraries, uh, these buildings are okay, but um, with this I end. So Henri Labrus. Now we go to the second uh, architect. I decided to present him, although I I did uh, I did present him twice. Uh, before uh, this year, but I have no choice, I guess. Another Frenchman, Jules Hardouin-Mansart, very quickly will go a little bit through his work. So Jules Hardouin-Mansart, 1646-1708, so about one century and a half older than, uh, or, uh, you know, being a predecessor of uh, Henri Labrust. Here was the man with his wig, uh, and uh, that time, you know, you could have easily, you know, confounded him with uh, the, the king, uh, the sun king, uh, uh, Louis Le Soleil. Jules Hardouin Mansart was born in April, but he died on the 11th of May. And that's the reason we talk about him today. Was a French Baroque architect and builder whose major work included the Place de Victoire, Place Vendôme, in Paris, the Dome Chapel of Les Invalides and the Grand Trianon of the Palace of Versailles. 
his monumental work was designed to glorify the reign of Louis XIV of France, the Sun King. Here he was in his splendor of a, of a you know, as a, as a, as a French architect. Um, the, the French value him very much. I, I find his architecture a little bit, uh, I don't know. Uh, it is not the best architecture that I know of, but uh, he was probably an interesting character. Uh, he took the name actually from his uncle, Francois Mansart, who uh, invented that uh, word that is used even in Romanian, Mansard. But it wasn't Jules Hardouin Mansart, it was Francois Mansart. So Jules Hardouin Mansart, you see, born in 1648 and died in 1708. He died 12 years before uh, Giovanni Battista Piranesi was born. I, I keep thinking of Piranesi because uh, the, the modernity of Piranesi uh, somehow is like a guiding mark for uh, a few centuries in architecture. Some drawings, I don't even know if he made this drawing or not, but it's his architecture, it's what he invented. Uh, it's called Baroque, but uh, I don't know. It's kind of a you know, classical. It's a, it's a restrained Baroque, although inside the interiors are Baroque all right. As you can see. Um, Church of the Hotel des Invalides in Paris, 1676, 1691. So again, um, Jules Hardouin Mansart. Um, so let's see if I can count correctly. About uh, 350 years ago, almost 350 years ago, is the church. Uh, this is important, you know. Uh, uh, you know, here you have. Let me see if I have a picture. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll arrive at it. Napoleon is, uh, is I mean, his, uh, you know, his uh, coffin, so to speak, is here in, 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 uh, in this uh, church, uh, the Zembalid. Uh, this building was done by, um, by Jules Hardouin Mansart and uh, is one of the glories of Paris. It's, you cannot miss it if you visit Paris. Everybody goes there because Napoleon is there. And, but now you know that the building was built by Jules Hardouin Mansart. And um, look at the plan, you know, it's apparently simple, you know, but uh, there are many complexities here. There is a lot of wall. Look at these thick, massive pillars, which are, you know, a few meters uh, thick or wide. That's the building. and. Uh, Yes, Napoleon himself is, uh, is, uh, is here, you know. Napoleon's tomb is inside the Les Invalides, and here it is, the triumphal uh, tomb, but, uh, you know, the tomb is a tomb, and who is inside is inside and will never get out unless he's the son of God, but, the, but Napoleon was not the son of God, so anyway. For the French, Napoleon means a lot. And uh, he was a remarkable uh, political leader, it's true. He made his mistakes because it's, it's difficult to escape uh, the, 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 the shadows of absolute power. So here is Napoleon, but the building around it is by Jules Hardouin Mansart. If you have time and interest, uh, please uh, check on, uh, on the web uh, Napoleon's quotations, you know, quotes, citate from, from, uh, from uh, Napoleon. You, you are going to come across some very interesting uh, thoughts. He was, a, he was a complex man. And uh, 
I mean, it's very well known that Napoleon was a very courageous man. He took risks. That's why he won so many unbelievable battles. But he, vis-a-vis -vis woman, he was very skeptical of the powers of man. He said, the only victory in front of a woman is to run away. That's what uh, the emperor uh, Bonaparte, Napoleon, um, thought. It is a good building, this one. I mean, you know, e even if you might be more attracted towards the fluidities of our time, you cannot ignore this building. That was uh, built uh, 300 and some years ago. And not because Napoleon is there, dead as he is, but, you know, the virtues of the building are uh, for all to see. Les Invalides, here it is. With a golden, uh, golden dome. Jules Hardouin Mansart, to be, uh, you know, uh, distinguished from or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, identified uh, distinctly vis-a-vis -vis Francois Mansart, his uncle. So there are two Mansart. One is Francois and the other one, Jules Hardouin Mansart. I think he took his name from his uncle, from Francois Mansart, in admiration, as an homage to him. The French are very interesting because, you know, they they brought upon the world, uh, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, they burned down the Masti, but they also have a great uh, respect for authority. And you see it in, in their urbanism, you know, and Osman also, you know, all the, the avenues, the boulevards converge towards the L'Arc de Triomphe. Here we see strict symmetry, axiality, you know, so it, this is not really, you know, the architecture of excessive freedom, but uh, the dualities of the French, I think, are, are uh, for all to see. On one hand, they are revolutionaries, and on the other hand, they, they, I think, they, they, they like having an emperor. They like authority, and then they re rebel against the authority. They, they have this duality, I think. And by the way of this, uh, after the, you know, the, the fire at Notre Dame, at the Cathedral de Notre Dame, I thought that in front of the cathedral, there should be another building. And in fact, I wrote the text for a possible competition because, because there could be the place for two women, not one, not just Marie, the mother of Jesus, but also Marianne, I don't know if you know about Marianne. Marianne was the woman depicted by Delacroix, you know, leading the revolutionaries of, um, you know, the French Revolution with a, with a French uh, uh, flag in her hand. And Marianne was the symbol of the revolution, the symbol of freedom. So I thought we should have face to face two women. Marie, the mother of Jesus, the sacred, and Marianne, the mother of social justice and the mother of revolution, the profane. So the sacred and the profane, two women facing each other. And, and there is the Point Zero in Paris, right in front of Notre Dame is where they start to measure the distances uh, you know, of, of the great capital of France from right there. So I thought symbolically it would be, uh, I mean, it is a very charged place, you know, a place for two women. If you are interested, I can send you the text because I still think the world needs a revolution in this sense towards, towards matriarchy, actually. Here is a, 
uh, a statue with uh, with uh, uh, Jules Hardouin Mansart and his, uh, you know, drawing, so to speak, and then of course to Raphael and anyway, he made it to become a, a statue. Hardouin Mansart's plan for a curving colonnade of Les Invalides not completed from 1700. Uh, so I guess he proposed this, but this was not made. Maybe inspired a little bit by Bernini's colonnade in front of um, San Pietro in Rome. Uh, it was not done like this. Hall of Mirrors of the Palace of Versailles, 1680. Now, yes, this is Baroque. Uh, all right, and the Baroque uh, for the king, for the, you know, for the, not, not any king, for the sun king, King Le Soleil, you know, the one and the only, Louis XIV. It was designed by Jules Hardouin Mansart, this, this room. What do we see here? Plenty of sculptures, of statues, you know, uh, chandeliers, uh, you know, uh, complex, uh, you know, domed, uh, uh, you know, uh, roofing, ceiling, uh, gold, a lot of gold. So, it, it, you know, it's the world of a king. It's not the world of a proletarian. The Hall of Mirrors. Jules Hardouin Mansart for King Le Soleil. Louis the Fourteenth, Versailles. Now the Royal Chapel at Versailles is this one. Again, Jules Hardouin Mansart, uh, with the help of artists. Here, there wasn't just the architect. He didn't do those, uh, you know, the, the painting of the ceiling. That was done by artists. The culmination of the buildings are always, you know, with gold because they were destined for the, you know, the golden positions in the French society of his time. That is the emperor, the, the king, the orangery at the palace of Versailles, also done by him. It's this building. Sorry about these pictures. Now the Grand Trianon in Versailles, also by Jules Hardouin Mansart. I prefer the, well, this is nice actually, but I wanted to say here that I prefer the flowers and the green, but this is nice as architecture it is. So Le Grand Trianon, also Versailles. I always admire more the gardener, André Le Notre at Versailles, but uh, the, the buildings are not too bad either. I, I like more the gardens, yes. I admire the genius of uh, André Le Notre the landscape architect, the designer, the, the gardener. Anyway, this is uh, Jules Hardouin Mansart again in Versailles. I, would really, I mean, yes, inside is Baroque, but towards the outside is a restrained Baroque.
Place de Victoire, Paris. And of course, in the center is, uh, is the king, the, you know, the victorious one, uh, Place de Victoire. I don't know if it's not called also Place de uh, Louis um, the 14th. I, I, I imagine he also did the buildings around the square. So it's not just uh, the square itself, which is not square, of course, it's oval. Here is the, um, you know, the king. This is an old, uh, I guess before the, uh, it became like this, uh, plus the victoire, it became a, a rounded, uh, rounded square. It's not actually an oval, it's, 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 it's a circle. Plus Vendôme also in Paris. This is also an important square in, in Paris. This one is actually called Place de Louis le Grand, meaning Louis le, le Soleil, with a, a column, uh, you know, uh, copying uh, the one for uh, the Emperor Trajan in Rome. Place Vendôme in Paris, uh, Jules Hardouin Mansart. You see the, the Sun King is uh, even on the, on the handrails of, of balconies. The Sun emanating uh, its, uh, its rays uh, in, in this way on this building. Are they interesting actually? This king really thought he was, uh, you know, descended from the sun. Plus Vendôme ou de Louis le, le Grand. I think he did all these buildings around the uh, uh, around the square. Now, another square, but in Dijon, not in Paris, the Place Royale in Dijon, with uh, some interesting uh, waterworks. We are going to see some pictures with people enjoying, uh, you know, the spontaneous water coming out of the, of the square. This is how it looked in, I don't know, the 18th century or the 19th century, uh, but now it looks different. And uh, not the buildings, but uh, the way the square became animated. I hope I have here pictures. Elevation. No, I don't. This is strange. I thought I had. Anyway, elevation of the central pavilion of Chateau de Clagny, built for Madame de Montespan. A rendering of the facade, Chateau de Dompierre. He built other things besides, um, you know, for the king. But they were from, from his entourage. You know. This man is a proletarian contemplating the aristocratic uh, uh, dwelling built by uh, Francois, by uh, Jules Hardouin Mansart. The door is open, the gate, so, you know, the tourists are welcome. Jules Hardouin Mansart, Chateau de Marly, uh, just uh, I don't think he built it. Pavillon Mansart in Vendre, um, 
I don't know. I don't think he lived here, but it carries his name now. Seventeenth century uh, architecture, the beginning of the eighteenth. Another uh, castle, Chateau du Val de, in Saint Germain, they, but this one was uh, refurbished, so to speak. I like it more in the old picture, Le Chateau du Val. This one was transformed indeed into an observatory in 1877, Chateau de Meudon, and you know. It's clear that yes, it became an observatory. Kind of interesting, you know, talking about conversions. Well, here is a conversion. Maison Royale de Saint Louis. And uh, I don't have a picture of this, but uh, this is, uh, sorry, I have it. Uh, so the marble bust is by Jean Louis Lemoine. Lemoine, Lemoine of Jules Hardouin Mansart is this one, and I don't know who is this. Uh, it's also a portrait of him, but I don't know who did it. Anyway, I think that's it uh, about Jules Hardouin Mansart. Now, the portrait of Hardouin Mansart by Francois de Troyes. Uh, it was that this this painting. And uh, what else is here? I think I, I, I titled it wrongly. I think this is um, Maison Royale de Saint Louis, is this one. Sorry, this one, which was not built. It's just a project or it was destroyed. And uh, scenes from the, from, from, from the life of the time. That's it. And now we go quickly uh, because you might be tired and I am a little bit too, to a very interesting German architect, Hugo Herring. Hugo Herring, who had the courage to fight Le Corbusier at the Siam um, gathering. And uh, I am tempted to think with all due respect for Le Corbusier that Hugo Herring was right. So, um, Let's, uh, let's read a little bit about this uh, enigmatic uh, German architect. Hugo Herring uh, was born on the 11th of May, 1882, was a German architect and architectural writer best known for his writings on organic architecture. And as a figure in architectural debates about functionalism in the 20s and 30s, though he had an important role as an expressionist architect, Herring was born in the Biberach and, and there, uh, I can read in the kingdom, kingdom of Württemberg, a student of the great Theodor Fischer, he took the view that each building should be uniquely developed according to the specific demands of the site and client. Few of Herring's designs were built, but he was a strong influence on his friend and colleague Hans Scharun a great expressionist architect. One build design was a contribution to the Siemensstadt housing project in Berlin from 1929 through 1931, which was master planned by Sharon. Herring was a founding member of both the Ring and Siam. He was married to actress Emilia Unda in 1918, the couple later divorced, and he married another actress, Roma Ban, in 1950. He died in Göppingen, aged 76. And uh, uh, this, this presentation I'm not very happy with because it's not, uh, it's not uh, made uh, sufficiently well structured, it's not chronological, but it's a short introduction to uh, the work of an interesting uh, German architect with a big forehead, as you can see, and they say the big foreheads uh, betray uh, high intelligence or so. Some drawings of uh, Hugo Herring. Uh, he opposed Le Corbusier because he, he had organic tendencies. And uh, although Corbusier began to have such, such tendencies later on with uh, Ronchamp and then Saint-Pierre de Firmini-Ver, 
at the time of those early Siam uh, gatherings, he was rather, you know, uh, thinking in, in rather strict and almost dogmatic terms. This kind of architecture, formally, uh, you know, significantly free, was foreign to Le Corbusier. So these drawings by uh, Hugo Herring show a different sensibility. Um, look at this house. You know, uh, I, I value it. I think it's very interesting. But it's the very opposite of Villa Savoie, for example, by Le Corbusier. There are interesting things here, like, for example, you know, these two rooms don't have a direct relationship with the outside, these two bedrooms. You know, the, the perimeter line of the house is here. So this one does have a window here, but uh, the other two don't. This is rather unique, so to speak. So yes, he did take a stand against Le Corbusier at one uh, session of the of the Siam gatherings, you know, Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne. Both uh, Le Corbusier and him were part of the, they were uh, founding members. Hugo Herring was a modern architect, but you see a different kind of modernity he advocated. Um, here is a. a Manifesto, but I, I don't feel like uh, reading it now. Uh, it's uh, rather late in this presentation. Anyway, um, if you want, I can send it to you. Uh, this is the cover of a book on him, Hugo Herring, and you see the detail of this uh, building uh, is uh, very different from uh, you know what uh, dogmatic. Uh, Know, functionalism or dogmatic, uh, rationalism or dogmatic, whatever uh, stands for. His ar architecture has uh, the, 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 the sensitivity of, uh, of uh, the organic matter. Uh, nature a little bit, there is a rurality, a rural spirit here. Now look at this building, uh, which I like very much. Um, you know, he uses bricks and wood. And look at the structure inside. This is, uh, you know, uh, very coherent, but again, built with wood. And uh, I, I think this work is, is very relevant to our time. Hugo Herring. Hello, sir. <laughs> you don't look too happy here. But the structure makes me smile because it makes me happy because it, it shows sensitivity and strength at the same time. Uh, it's, it's ingenious and it's uh, the building, the whole, the whole building is, uh, is uh, uh, Le Corbusier could not have built such a building. He built other buildings brilliantly, but this kind of architecture he couldn't do. And he didn't want to do. In a way, Hugo Herring is, um, you know, anticipating uh, uh, some some buildings by Alvaro Alto, you know, uh, lyrical functionalism, uh, Scandinavian, uh, not only Scandinavian. Anyway, uh, he, this architect uh, didn't. Uh, make a name for himself for nothing. Uh, sorry for the resolution of this picture. This is the plan of another house he designed. I don't know if he built it, but uh, you see there is freedom, appreciable freedom. Hans Sharon, his friend and colleague worked kind of in the same way. Uh, I don't think I have here the small house he built, well, part of a 
large uh, building in Vienna at the Werkbund uh, Vienna, I don't know, in 1920s something or the early 30s, which I saw with students from here, but um, I don't think I have pictures here. Anyway, Hugo Herring is interesting and he didn't build a lot, but uh, he showed the, uh, you know, the, the road not taken, a, a different kind of modernity, uh, you know, more organic, more subtle in a way, less, uh, less ambitious in terms of willfulness, assuming also gracefulness and uh, with something, I would say, rural. Hello, sir. Um, interesting work. This building is interesting. Another cover of a book on him, Hugo Herring, architect that's known uh, Bowens. We saw this uh, drawing of a house, but I don't know if he built it. It's an excellent building, this one. Um, I think it was supposed to be a larger complex. This is the building with that structure, wooden structure that we saw, but I, I think he, he was supposed to build other buildings, but only that one got built. This one. Although there might be two buildings, this one looks different from this one. This one we saw in that uh, in that model. There is also a Gothic, kind of a Gothic element in this kind of work, you know, this kind of romantic, uh, uh, you know, organicism that seems more related with the with the Gothic than the Renaissance sensibility. This is not by him, but I wanted to show um, works that were influenced, kind of influenced, or uh, around the same time, there was another trend in architecture, the expressionist vein of modernism. So this one also is not by Hugo Herring. Nor this one, nor this one, nor this one. This is the, you know, the, yeah, the, the other modernity, the one that uh, actually didn't, didn't win the fight with the, uh, you know, the with with a strict functionalism and so on. This is a chair, an interesting uh, piece of furniture, isn't it? You no, know, complex and uh, probably even moderately uh, comfortable. But it's interesting how, you know, the articulations of various parts. It, 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 it seems more uh, more uh, uh, complex than it should be. Although this probably has the ability to extend to become some kind of a long or something. It has it has parts which move. Uh, it's interesting. It's in wood, and uh, the material might make it look a little bit, uh, you know, so-called traditional, but if it was not in wood, it would have been definitely modern. Uh, here he is with Miss van der Rohe, on the left Miss, on the right uh, uh, Hugo Herring. Uh, miss does look uh, Americanized, so to speak, with a nice uh, suntan, alarmingly obvious, almost. Um, Hugo Herring, we saw this one, we saw this one, we saw this one. I'm not happy with this presentation, but uh, 
yeah, I have to make another one about Google Herring, obviously. We saw this one. We, we didn't see this one. This was his proposal for um, the Chicago Tribune Tower. Consider the most important co architectural competition of the 20th century. And this year, it is its centennial. It took place in 1922. And uh, we are now in 2022, 100 years later. And I wrote two texts for a kind of a, a new kind, towards a new kind of verticality. Because I don't think today, although we are able to build to the sky, to the, to the sun, taller and taller buildings, but I think we need a different kind of verticality, uh, more, uh, a, a less, uh, less uh, sure of itself in a way. Anyway, um, I can send you the text if you want, the texts, because I wrote two. We saw this one, we saw again uh, these drawings, but this is done by Miss van der Rohe for a tower that he never built in Berlin, but I, I, I love this project by Miss van der Rohe, uh, but it was never built. This is the rendering, his rendering, and this is the plan of the tower by Miss van der Rohe. Again, this was never built. Uh, this is the plan of a house by Hugo Herring. This is the plan of a house by uh, Miss. Again, Hugo Herring, uh, detail of a block of flats by Hugo Herring. And this is an apartment building that he built uh, the site plan was designed by his colleague and friend, Hans Sharun. Uh, even this block of flats, although it's not extravagant in any way, actually Hugo Herring is a rather modest architect, but I think his modesty is, is, a, is a quality and should be appreciated and known. So it's a block of flats, but you see, it's not banal, it has it has a character and it has a certain, you know, a tectonic uh, lyricism. It functions and uh, yeah, it was built. And this is probably his grave. Otherwise, why should I have put this picture here? Uh, there isn't even, uh, you know, as opposed to Napoleon, in fact, now I'm, I'm feeling, uh, you know, uh, drawing a parallel between Napoleon's tomb and Hugo Herring. Of course, Hugo Herring was not an emperor and his tomb, if there is a tomb, but there is no tomb. It's just, a, you know, a, a place on the ground where there is just grass and flowers. Maybe we should all have something like this at the most. Another uh, block of flats by him, those with colors. Uh, we saw this one, we saw this one, we didn't see this one, but we almost saw this one as well. That's it. I'm not going to show Frederick Kisler now, but uh, I thank you for being here.